All right, guys, everybody wants to know how to buy a house without spending any money to buy the house, right? Wouldn't that allow you to do a lot of deals? Well, today we're going to talk about how to get a free house. You've heard that saying in the business through subject to real estate investing. Now, those low equity deals are tough to turn into a profit, right? A lot of people know that. And I felt that pain in my business early on. and I didn't know what to do. So I reached out to this man we have on the podcast today. He's a mentor of mine. He's taught me pretty much anything and everything I know about this strategy, which is subject to and low equity types of transactions. And he's going to break down what a subject to owner financing transaction is today. We're going to talk about some of the, the nuances of this. And then there's going to be a special opportunity for you guys live this weekend. There's going to be an online boot camp from nine to five. Tim rarely ever does this, but the situation that we're in right now, he's had to take these events online, but it's going to be an incredible event, guys. You're going to be able to attend that and have live interaction, uh, case studies, how he does his marketing for the deals, the contracts, paperwork. We're going to dig into all the bells and whistles at the end of this. But let me introduce you to my mentor, Tim Cook here in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. He's actually uh, the founder of the West DFW REI Club or group. Maybe which one is it, Tim? You can tell me in a second. It's group. Uh, group. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to break down this process because as you guys know, there's a huge wealth creation opportunity coming and a lot of people bought houses just a few years ago that are not going to have equity. And when this big foreclosure boom comes, there's really only so many ways that you can help them. And the subject to strategy is one of the ways that you can do this. And this is a great way to start building your portfolio if you're not bank financeable. Tim, Welcome to the call. Thanks, Connor. Good seeing you. Happy to be here. Excited to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I remember, you know, getting frustrated. I was paying a lot of money for marketing and everybody knows what to do with a, a high equity deal. You can pretty much do anything with it. You can also flip it, keep it, rent it, owner finance it, whatever you want to do with it. Anything you can do with that. But what about those deals that don't have equity? Can you kind of really break down on a, on a high level view? You, you, you know more about this than probably anybody I know on what a subject to deal is and how this can help with low equity transactions. And then let's talk about your take on where we are with this crazy situation with the virus all over the world, shutting down everything and what you think is going to happen over the coming years uh, with these properties. And do you think we're going to see a lot of foreclosures coming? What are you doing to prepare? Sure, Connor, I'd be happy to do that. Um, let me just back up just a, a little bit and just tell everybody that uh, I've been doing this for 20 years this year. And you know, one of my mentors in my very first boot camp or training that I went to, I uh, heard this statement, and that was, if you don't write a check, you can't lose money. And that really caught my attention, wouldn't it you? I mean, uh, what, a, what a statement, right? And um, after getting into it, what it meant was, if you learn how to negotiate the deals correctly and make the right offers, you can't lose any money. Well, when you get into the subject to strategy, um, you know, you're, there's a lot of risk there if you do it wrong. And uh, one of the things that I will go into great detail in this workshop is how you can go in and make an offer on any house. It's all on how you write that offer and, uh, and, and you want to get it under contract as quick as you can. And then go back and just make sure that you do the pre-screening correctly and, and, and write the, the right contract on it. And uh, there's a lot of things we're gonna get into. I'm not gonna um, skip over these details on Saturday. We're gonna go into the detail about what makes a good sub two? How do you know that? How, what kind of questions to ask when you're pre-screening the sellers? And, and, uh, and then trying to put together the offer that's going to give you multiple exit strategies. So um, you can go in and one of my favorite uh, deals, and of course, wholesalers don't like this. Uh, they like big chunks of equity, right? But with this, these strategies we're going to be talking about, you can make an offer and make money on every house that you put under contract if you know what you're doing. And, and that's what the goal will be when you walk out the door Saturday evening. You'll be knuckle dragging, exhausted, but excited because you have a new tool in your toolbox and will be able to go make offers on that you have never been able to do before. So that's what we're going to be talking about Saturday. Yeah, guys, and I'll actually be on there for part of it. So you get to talk to me and ask me some questions. So this is uh, August 8th, 9 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's going to be an online event. And this is going to be full interactive workshop. It's going to be great. Now, Absolutely. what does subject to mean? And um Kind of break that down. Let's talk about what this is and then also why the state of the market, why we're trending towards this being a very popular strategy as it was in the last foreclosure boom. 
Okay, so the term buying houses subject to means that you're buying that house subject to the underlying mortgage remaining in place. So when you hear, hear that term subject to, it means that there is at least one mortgage, maybe more on that property. Um, in Texas, you're, you have your mortgage and you have your deed on that property. So you're going to purchase the uh, home, you're gonna get the deed, and you'll hear that term in this business as well as you're gonna get the deed on that property, but the mortgage is going to remain in the original borrower's name and you will still be able to buy it that way and then you will, um, whatever agreement you have with the seller, you'll take over those payments or your new buyer will take over those payments. So that's what the term subject to means. Um, probably one, if you don't mind, Connor, I'll go ahead and jump into the due on sale clause question because uh, many home sellers uh, as well as investors are worried about that due on sale clause. And what that means is, um, and I won't um, uh, give you the exact wording, but it, it states basically that if there's a change in ownership, that the lender has the right, not the obligation, they have the right to be able to call that mortgage due in full, meaning they're going to tell you to pay it off or they're going to take you to foreclosure. Um, rarely, rarely, rarely ever happens. I won't say never. And I try not to ever say that word because there's always things that could happen, but it's a rare thing. Yep. So when you're dealing with these banks going forward, um, one of the things I think you're going to dig into closely is the way to transfer this over. And you're going to go over, I believe the, the insurance process, uh, this weekend. I know we had another podcast we went into this with Tim guys on my other channel. We did two previous podcasts. Some of our most few podcasts go check those out as well, but uh, kind of give a quick uh, run over this, but you're going to really dig into deep on this as well as other ways to really make sure that you uh, transfer these properties over correctly and, and the paperwork that you use to do this. And then some of the ways that you negotiate these deals and explain this to these homeowners so that they understand everything is going to go through on the up and up and done correctly to protect both you and them as well. You bet. So insurance is probably one area that is highly misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, uh, from, a, from a seller's perspective, it's one of the questions you're going to receive uh, without a doubt about insurance. When can they cancel their insurance? Um, and my answer is always that um, you don't want to cancel until I call you and ask you to do that. What that means from my perspective is I've done my job and I have it in place so that I'm now covered. Uh, what you don't want to do is ever turn off insurance before you have it covered because you don't want the lender um, to initiate their what they call force placed policy. Uh, Saturday, we're going to have our expert insurance uh, agent with Burdick Insurance. Dave Burdick is going to be there in, himself in person. And he is going to walk you through those steps of exactly how you have to do that step by step so that the lender doesn't call it due. Now, one of the big questions that I hear frequently from investors is, um, aren't, by changing the name on the primary insured policy, aren't they going to call the loan due? No. You know, I mean, they, they could, they can go on public records and see that you're the new owner, your trust is the new owner, um, but they don't. All they care about at the end of the day is that their asset is insured and they're receiving the payments. So again, we'll get into it in detail. There's a lot of steps that you wanna go through to do that insurance change correctly. And you do not, you do not need to be uh, unclear to the seller. The seller has to be on board with what you're doing and so does your insurance agent on what you need to do. Oh, by the way, not all insurance companies are created equal <laughs> and not all of them will, <laughs> you're laughing, Connor. Um, not all insurance companies will cover these types of deals. So you want to deal with the correct insurance agent that knows what they're doing. Not one that says they know, they need to know what they're doing. Okay, great, great. So I'm just curious to know, so, you know, over the past 
six, seven, eight, nine years, the market's been extremely hot, which means there's deals are hard to find, but there's money everywhere in the marketplace. Now, as this turns and we start to see all these deals come in the marketplace, it's going to be that there's deals everywhere, but money's hard to find. And one of the big benefits of doing the strategy is it's not very capital intensive. You can actually uh, take a free house, but you're going to talk about different case studies and digging in the numbers because you don't always want to take over every free house, which I think a lot of investors don't understand is it's so difficult in their mind to get someone uh, through the negotiation process to do this with them that they just think if they're going to do it, it's one they could take over. So I know you're going to dig into that in detail, but I know that you've been doing this for, for 20 years, living through the 0811 correction and seeing what that did. Can you kind of give a, your take on what it was like with this strategy in your business during that time and what you are expecting to see during this uh, correction? Cause I hear lots of different people give different opinions, but um, to me, I don't see that's possible. We don't see a massive foreclosure wave, whether it starts kicking in into this year, middle of next year, following year, the year after that. It's just the music will stop playing these extensions, these backstops, the money's going to stop going. And when it does, it's going to be a flood, in my opinion. So you and I think an awful lot alike, Connor, in that regard. You know, I've been on several of the uh, calls where nationwide economists get on, you know, and they uh, make their predictions about the market not going to be the same as it was in, in an 08, 09 timeframe and, and how things went there. Uh, I don't know. I'm not that smart, you know. One thing that we do know about COVID is we don't know anything, right? It makes up its own mind, does its own thing, and that's how things are such a big mess. I don't have a clue what's going to really happen to the market. Based on what I see happening, the fact that we have record-breaking unemployment rates and record-breaking COVID numbers and not getting any better in a lot of parts of the of the country and, and of the Metroplex. I mean, just DFW alone is not doing so great. So uh, a lot of those people are, if, if we don't get back to work soon for those folks, there's going to be a problem. And, you know, I certainly don't wish bad on those people, but when they call for help, I want to be ready to help. And that's what I think that the audience here should be thinking too, is that they should be standing by, have their tools sharpened here and know how to go about using them. I do believe that uh, it's not going to be much longer and we're going to start seeing some of those people stepping up and looking for alternatives. The government subsidies are running out, um, unemployment's running out. And, you know, for many of them, I mean, think about all the businesses that have permanently closed that have been around for many, many years. Those people need income and, and they currently don't have it. So um, I think we're going to be ready and stand by to help them provide solutions. And that's what I hope everybody on the call here understands is that you're offering a solution. You're not taking advantage of people. You're offering a solution to people that need help. They're looking for a way out. They're looking for a way to um, protect their credit. They're looking a way for, you know, to get rid of the debt and move on to the next phase in their life. And that's what we do. Well, a lot of people are going to get foreclosed on. There's going to be a lot of people with bad credit and the traditional financing route's not going to be available for them. And also I hear all the time as you, you know, you run your club and you've been working with investors for a long time. A lot of times you talk to people and they're like, well, I'm only wholesaling selling flipping. You ask them, do you want to start buying rental properties? And they say, yes, of course. But they say, I'm not financeable, right? They're trying to get to that point, but they don't need to be financeable to be able to do the strategy. Can you kind of explain why that is the case? And um, Absolutely. This is a great strategy for uh, building a portfolio, uh, whether that's a, a rental or an owner finance portfolio, because your credit doesn't matter. Um, it's not affected. It's not impacted. Uh, using this kind of strategy has allowed me to keep my 838 credit score that I've had from day one. I've bought one house uh, for my business with my personal credit because I've learned these strategies and others. Um, but this is really one of my main buying strategies. And um, it, you don't need the credit because there's no credit checks done. Um, it's not any ding on your credit. And because of that, you have unlimited buying power. Your only limitation is you. 
look in the mirror and ask yourself, what's my limits? Because that's really it. How, how fast can you market? How fast can you respond to the sellers? Uh, Pre-screen, write contracts, you know, make offers, close them, and, 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 and implement your exit strategy, whatever that's going to be. Buy and hold is a great strategy uh, when you buy subject to, uh, but you also have a huge opportunity, uh, which is another whole class in itself when you start talking about owner finance wraparound mortgages. But when you think about the market in the last, let's just say five years and how low the interest rates have been, so three, four, five percent interest rates, if you take over those mortgages sub subject to, and then you sell those on wraparound mortgages at eight, nine, 10%, man, what a cash flow that's going to be for you. So just a huge, huge, huge opportunity. If you're not excited, you need a hearing aid or something because this is a huge opportunity for make a lot of money. And right. again, there's no guarantee when this is coming. Um, I, I've been trying to get my crystal ball fixed and it, and it's just not working. We don't know, but I'm pretty sure we're going to see a huge change in the market soon. Yeah. I mean, think about this guys, you only need, you know, 15, 20 quality, quality, nice brick rancher type of houses. If you're working for your retirement, uh, to take these over and, you know, decades down the road, think about what you have sitting there waiting for you when these properties pay down and go free and clear. Um, what, are, what are some of the biggest hurdles you see with investors trying to get in from a traditional strategy, like flipping houses or just, you know, regular, a lot of people do a burst strategy where they just buy stress rental property with uh, interest only loan, credit line, hard money lender, private money lender. They fix it up. They go back and finance out very logistically heavy, lots of working parts, long process. Um, and then they see this, they want to do this. They think it's quicker. What are some of the hurdles that you see um, people trying to start out? What do you think is the biggest besides believing that it can actually be done, which is one of them, but um, is it the negotiation? They don't know how to explain it. Is um, uh, the marketing side, they don't know where to find these deals. What do you think is the biggest hurdle? And I know you're going to go over a lot of these in detail uh, yep. on the weekend, but um, just from your- we, Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, we, we will be going over that quite a bit on Saturday. Um, one of the biggest hurdles I think is them. Look in the mirror. Uh, you know, a lot of people- come in when they're brand new in this strategy or brand new in the business, they just have a hard time understanding that this is possible. Um, so when you go talk to a seller about taking over the mortgage and all, and all the things you're going to do for them, if you don't believe it, they're not going to believe it. It's going to show through. You have to be confident in your presentation. You have to have your story in place and, you can't spit and sputter out there about what you're going to do and how things work. You need to understand it so you can explain it. Okay. Um, many sellers from my perspective is uh, they're looking for solutions and you need to be able to provide a solution to their particular problem and you need to match it up. You know, if they got two or three, two or three issues going on, you need to make sure that your solution of taking over their mortgage and the whole process of how, what you're going to do next and how long it's going to take and so forth. It, it needs to be well explained, well understood and make them comfortable. Um, if they're not comfortable with what you're going to say or what you're telling them, you're probably not going to get the deal. No. And the other thing I want to tell you is that a lot of people think that, buying a house subject to only a seller that's in distress is going to sell that way. But I'm here to tell you, I've done a lot of subject to deals of people that had great credit and they were looking for a solution to, to protect their credit. So it's not just about, they don't care about the, the debt anymore. They want a solution um, and, and to whatever the, the problem is that they have. So uh, a lot of, a lot of sub two sellers, and I think you're going to see it again. A lot of them are going to be looking for a solution to protect the credit that they still have. You know, things are going downhill because of what's going on with COVID-19. But I think they're going to be looking for a solution to, to stop the bleeding where it's at and looking for a Band-Aid. Yep. 
one of the power, most powerful strategies to do with this is you're going to buy it on the front side, step to acquisition, and then you're going to owner finance wrap it. Can you maybe go through and explain like the Armelo, what that process is, and then on the back end, uh, a loan servicer and kind of give a high level view of this. And then I know on the weekend, you're going to really dig into like how you structure the numbers, like percentages, what you're selling it, how you kind of back into this stuff. But can you just get a give, given overview looking down what it would look like from when you buy the property to your exit strategy and then the couple parts in there in the between that most people should have in, uh, in their mind before they start trying to do this. Okay. Um, so the, uh, what Connor, the point Connor's bringing up is, is a good one because there's quite a few moving parts to this. And I, I'd like to just back up and say one other thing um, where the, you asked me earlier, Connor, about where some investors struggle uh, and don't understand this, this process. One of them is uh, details. This is not like a, a simple wholesale deal, put it under contract, assign it, go to closing and get paid. This is not that kind of deal, okay? Um, if that's the kind of person you are and that's all you want, you don't, do not want to do subject twos. I think Connor would agree with that. There's a lot of moving parts here, and I'm just being honest with you. I want you to come to the workshop, but I, I, I don't want you to be misled and think this is an easy deal. There's a lot of work involved in these because the, from the time you start marketing to the negotiations, pre-screening, writing the offer, the documentation, there's more documents. We're going to get into that Saturday, but there's more documentation for a subject to kind of deal. Um, you know, there's more unique things, as we mentioned earlier, about the insurance and then getting it closed. So once you've got it closed, now you need a system in place to handle the insurance, make sure it's paid, make sure the mortgage is paid on time um, so that you don't have late payments. That late payment would be one of the biggest triggers to potentially uh, trigger the due on sale clause. So you don't ever want to be late at all. So um, in relation to Connor's question, loan servicing is important. Whether you do loan servicing while you are the owner or if you decide to owner finance, owner finance wrap it, uh, at, at that point, you certainly want to have a loan servicing company. Uh, we happen to use August REI and have for many years. And what they do is they collect the payment from your buyer they make the mortgage payment to the underlying mortgage, and hopefully there's a profit check that goes to you every month. Um, some, some deals are pretty slim, but uh, you know, hopefully that's coming to you. So, but they monitor that and they ensure that the payment's paid on time, which is absolutely crucial, okay? And uh, if they had to establish an escrow account, then they make sure that the taxes and insurance are paid as well. So very, very important. But the documentation of that whole deal is, is very uh, critical. You need a system. You need to be detail oriented. You need to document the due dates of payments. If there's any kind of agreement between you and the seller on, are you paying them any kind of equity payment? Do you owe them a, a, a note for their equity in the deal or, did, or how does that work? Is it something you do, you're gonna pay off when um, you sell the house? in the future. I mean, all those details matter. Okay. Keep it in touch. What, what about the RMLO? Uh, a lot of agents or a lot of uh, investors always ask me about this. And then after we talk about the RMLO, let's kind of talk about um, kind of way you look at a deal. Cause some are going to have repairs. Some are not going to have repairs. Um, yep. Some are going to cash flow a tiny amount. Some may cash flow a lot. And, but some may have equity in the property, even though they don't cash flow a lot and just, I'm sure people want to kind of, you know, see inside your mind a little bit how you look at those types of deals. But let's talk about the RMLO process first and what that, what that is and why uh, an investor should use, use one. So the uh, RMLO comes into play when you are going to owner finance that um, home out to your new buyer. So let's say you bought that home uh, for $100,000. it has got an underlying interest rate of uh, 3%. And... Now you're going to go sell it for 150,000 at eight percent. So uh, Dodd Frank changed some rules a few years ago, and to protect the consumer, the buyer, uh, we now need to use an RMLO. 
there's a lot of um, uh, if this, then that kind of rules on whether or not you need the RMLO for one deal a year, five deals a year. Uh, I just recommend everybody that implement the RMLO. That way you're covered. And what they're doing is they're verifying income on your buyer. They're verifying credit. They're verifying uh, the ability to pay. And, um, and they get all the required documentation as if they were a conventional lender and or conventional buyer going to a bank. They get all that documentation taken care of for you so that you are out of the picture there. There's no way to manipulate their ability to pay. It's all done by them. And then all those documents are sent to the title company for closing. Um, and, and then once they're closed, then you, you pay a fee for that. There's a, a couple different companies here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that are, are pretty well known. And um, it, it really is kind of an insurance thing for you for the future to help prevent problems if you ever end up in court. If you start buying 10 properties or owner financing 10 properties a year out, you're gonna need that RMLO anyhow. And if you ever end up in court, that'll be an important piece of that. Okay, great. Now let's look at how like to back into one of these deals. So obviously, you know, we, we hear get the D, get the free house. That's, that's not likely can happen pick these up uh, with very little in them, but a lot of times you're going to have expenses. You're going to have uh, maybe guess I'll let you write them off, you know, like back, uh, back these, uh, maybe let's talk about um, getting like an authorization to release information. So you know what their, their loan is because a lot of times they're going to tell you something that's clear. They, they may even think in good faith, what they say is what they owe. Right. They're wrong. Right. Yep. <laughs> and, and also by the time you get to closing uh, there could be more fees add up. So talk about the common fees as well as like how you look at repairs uh, and all these that they should be aware of as they go into this, because uh, as you get involved in the negotiations, <clears throat> excuse me, this can change quite drastically really quick on you. Sure. So um, the, the, the bottom line there with a lot of this stuff, Connor, is, is pre-screening. I mean, it's one of the things that you as a, a subject to buyer need to really get your arms around and pre-screen thoroughly with the, the seller on uh, what is owed on that property. And, you know, of course, you can't just call the mortgage company. You have to have that third party authorization or you can jump on the phone on a conference call with the seller and have give them a list of the questions that you want to ask and have them ask all those questions live on the phone so that you hear the answers firsthand. Uh, very important that you understand what you're getting into. Now, I'm not one to worry about nickel and dime fees and stuff. You know, if, if I'm, as long as I understand the ballpark on it, then I'm good. Um, so I don't care about you know, a bunch of little stuff. What you do need to know though is, um, you know, are there any other liens on that property? Is there any IRS liens? Is there any um, uh, mechanics liens? You know, maybe they had the roof replaced and didn't pay the contractor. That's where your title company is gonna come in. You're gonna wanna get title work done. Um, as soon as you get that contract uh, signed, get it over there and let the title company pull title on it and, and verify and confirm what kind of liens are against the property. Um, so regarding repairs though, as Connor mentioned, you know, there's, there's, you know, I've never done a deal yet that I've been close on rehab costs. I'm sure you know what I mean, Connor. I mean, there's always the unforeseen. Now I'm a little, I'm a little fussy in my repairs. So I spend a little more money on my houses on and making them nice. But you, as a business owner, have to establish what your business model is going to be on this type of deal, just like anything else. What I mean by that is there's a lot of subject to buyers, investors out there that don't want to lift a finger to a house, even though it's only two years old. So there's not much to it. There's always work to a house, even if it's one year old or even brand new whether it's curb appeal, cleaning, staging, there's always something that can be done to improve what's there. That's a decision that you're gonna to have to make on how much you wanna spend on it. That needs to be a part of your analysis and taken into consideration. Um, getting into some of the low equity homes, 
and still needing repairs. We're going to get into this really heavy on Saturday to talk about low to no equity deals. Uh, I've done a lot of deals that you know a lot of investors would never take on because on the surface it doesn't look like there's any equity. But if I can go in there and determine I don't want to, if I don't want to spend money, on it, I can offer home a work for equity kind of deal. So many homeowners, owner finance owners, want to do the work themselves. They'd much rather go in and paint it the color they want, put the countertops in that they want, do the bathroom the way they want. So what does that mean to you? It means that you don't have to uh, ask as much, or maybe you don't have to put uh, money into it because they're willing to do it. What if there's no equity in the deal? What if you buy a house that's worth 150 and let's say they're, they owe 140? Well, that's no equity to speak of. Let's say it's 145 even. Most, most people are going to turn that down. But in this business, we're going to talk about this Saturday. I'm going to show you how you can increase the value of that home by the way you market it for sale and, uh, and still be able to make money on those houses. And if you don't, I'm going to show you how to negotiate that contract so that you can't lose money on it. <laughs> and, that, and we're going to get into deals like that. We're going to talk about those because a lot of people think oh, that's not a deal. Well, I'm here to tell you, I'll show you some ways that you can still make money on those things. Let's dig into this event here. You're going to do a nine to five all day uh, boot camp here on Saturday on August 8th. And uh, guys, if unfortunately you don't uh, come to this uh, podcast until it's after this time, there's going to be a link below here as well that you can watch the replay. Now, the big benefit for hopping on uh, the all day workshop for one, I'll be on there. You can ask me questions and you can bring your deals. You can bring your personal questions. You, you may be involved in a deal right now and, and Tim may be even able to walk you through it. So there's going to be a lot of uh, benefit to be on at live time, but let's start kind of give me a walk through what the day is going to look like. You're going to start in the beginning and go throughout the day, kind of touch on what you're going to go over. And uh, cause guys, Tim used to n not do this on the internet and it was uh, a big deal here in Dallas. A lot of people go out there to his events. He'd do a couple times a year. And now because of the situation we're in, and uh, he's going more tech. Uh, now all you around the country actually have the opportunity to do this uh, and, and get to learn from Tim, which is a, a real thing. Uh, so kind of break down what you have planned for this event. And guys, uh, if you're interested in uh, getting to meet me this weekend and talk to me and Tim on this uh, work during this workshop, there's going to be a link below this video uh, that you can sign up to this and it will be a live event here in just a couple of days from now. Thanks, Connor. The, uh, the link Connor is referring to will have this agenda in it for Saturday. Uh, but basically, we're going to start off with an overview for those people that didn't get to come to my uh, my investor group uh, presentation a couple weeks ago, where we talked about the pros and cons of of doing sub two deals. We really got into the, you know, what to look for, how to analyze it, kind of thing. We're going to get into it even more on Saturday. But we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna start there, and then we're gonna go through uh, marketing strategies, all the different ways that we use in today's world. Uh, to locate those kind of deals. We're going to get into pre-screening, what to ask, um, uh, how to ask it, and then just shut up and listen to what uh, the seller is telling you. Because it's important that if you ask certain questions, you want them to just spill their guts. We're going to get into that in detail. Um, I'm also, as for those that do register, you're going to, when you get your welcome email, it's going to have a, uh, several different forms in there. One of them is a special property information sheet that I've been using for years. So the stuff that you're going to get Saturday are things that I've been using for many years. So just think about that. That, that should be good stuff for you. Um, so you'll have that property information sheet. The reason that's so important is I want you to fill out that property information sheet and bring it to class Saturday. We want to be able to do as many of those deals in the class, if you're willing, we want to get, break them down, analyze them. Is it a deal, not a deal? Why is it not a deal? Um, and then uh, go through and, and start talking about structuring offers. We're going to talk about multiple offer strategies. I, I rarely submit more or less than three offers. So we're going to show you all the different ideas, different ways to approach it, and what it means on all these different uh, offer strategies. But this is gonna be a big part of your success in uh, getting these kind of deals under contract. We're gonna go through the steps, step by step, 
of a sub two deal. I'm gonna bring some of my own deals. I hope you bring some of yours and we'll go through those. Um, so that's the case studies. Uh, exit strategies, we're gonna sit down and talk about depending on what the deal is that we're, we're presenting to the class, we're going, going to go through and talk about what exit strategies are best for that deal. You don't ever want to go into these kind of deals without having uh, multiple exit strategies because things don't always work the way you want. Who, who would have ever expected COVID to hit a couple months ago, right? So if you're not thinking about COVID as part of not only your buying strategy, but your selling strategy or renting, you better be thinking about it. With evictions the way they are, with foreclosures coming with uh, the foreclosure moratoriums, you know, things on hold, you better be thinking about both the in, uh, purchase and the exit strategy related to COVID. Uh, and you, you should be keeping up on what's going on due to COVID. Uh, we're also gonna be talking about the insurance. I mentioned that earlier, we're gonna go through in detail uh, and, and explain how that has to be done. We're going to talk, we're gonna talk about, how do you talk to the mortgage company? What happens if you buy a, a subject to deal and you have a fire? This is a real deal, guys. I had one. So uh, I'm gonna walk you through how that happened, what transpired. My owner, my seller was in Okinawa, Japan. So we're gonna talk about communications and how that all transpired and what the outcome of it was. Um, we're gonna talk about forms. You aren't gonna believe this. I can't believe that I uh, am doing this, but I'm going to include, I, I don't know how many it is, Connor, it's probably eight to 10 of, of the actual forms that I use, contracts, disclosures, um, CYA letters, all that stuff. The real stuff that I use in my business I'm gonna provide as part of this class at the end of the class. So you gotta to come to the class in order to get that. We're gonna talk about communications with the sellers after closing. You think that's gonna be important? I can tell you that if you don't have a good relationship with the seller in this type of scenario, it's not like a wholesale deal again. You know, wholesale deal, you go to closing, you'll never see them again, it doesn't matter. Subject to deals, you're now a family, you have a long term relationship and you need to make sure that you treat them that way and they need to understand it, the importance of closing it. Remember, the name, the mortgage is still in their name and that's the thing they have to remember. So we're going to talk about how to um, help that communications uh, along and keep it in place and, and uh, help you be successful. Then we're going to get into the closing day, how to ensure that the deals close. I have never in 20 years had one of my deals fall apart at the closing table. And there's some, some reasons for that. We're gonna get into that detail on Saturday so that we can make sure that you don't have that uh, same or that issue at all. And then testimonials and reviews. Um, we're gonna talk about the criticality of getting that uh, testimonial or that review done as soon as possible not a month later, a year later, it's kind of you're smiling. You want that, that review done and it's challenging. And, and uh, we'll talk about some ideas on how to do that. So that's kind of a quick overview. Again, it's all on the, the link below this podcast and uh, you can go see and read that stuff for yourself. Yeah, this is going to be an incredible event. And a lot of you guys, you know, you're dropping a lot of money. You're spending a lot of effort on your business on, on marketing for deals. And you, you're, you're flipping houses, wholesaling, buying rentals. But you come across these leads all the time. And what you normally do is you trash them or you refer them to a real estate agent. This is a way for you to start building equity and, and building cash flow without having to take on a lot of risk. Um, now, what I'm surprised that you're doing now, because you didn't used to do this, uh, is you're giving out your paperwork. And really, as you guys know, in real estate, you're only as good as your contracts. And uh, I know when I went to Tim, because Tim is one of my personal mentors, uh, I think you tried to sell me your contracts for like $3,000 when I started out. So he should have been more. <laughs> I would have paid it, like, to be honest. Because let me think about it. What stops people from doing uh, things all the time is not having all the pieces of the puzzle. 
And so a lot of times people don't go and try to make these offers because they don't think they can go through with it because they don't have the paperwork in place or they don't have right. uh, the basics. And same thing with the lease option strategy. I see that all the time where people just don't do it because they don't have the necessary paperwork, nor do they have it, nor do they want to invest. Uh, I mean, think about guys, if you pay an hour for an attorney, what, what is that like three to $500 depending? And if you're going to drop eight to 10 documents, do the math on that. So that right there alone, uh, in my opinion, is worth coming. Um, is there anything else, uh, Tim, you want to leave um, as we close this one up? But guys, there's links below this video. Uh, we will be doing this live on the 8th uh, from 9 to 5. And then if you unfortunately can't get there for the live event, there will also be a link down there with a the replay that we'll add a little bit later for you guys. So the only thing I would say in closing, Connor, is that, um, you know, I, I enjoy this strategy uh, and I love teaching it too because I, it's so unique and has such a huge opportunity to help not just you as an investor, but to help so many sellers. There's so many sellers out there that are going to be looking for a solution. And, you know, just a lot of your average investors that are wholesalers and stuff aren't necessarily going to uh, be providing the right solution. I get a lot of leads come across my desk from investors on subject to deals that are trying to assign them. And I can tell you that some of the documentation and, and the way they've structured it is not good and it just makes it hard. And I'm not sure that I kind of feel sorry for the sellers too, because I'm always trying to make sure they're protected. Yep. Um, in 20 years of doing this, I've never had one of these deals go south on me. And uh, I want to make sure that's true for you. I'm going to spill my guts to you as much as I can give you in the time, quite honestly, with, a, with throwing in all the forms, Connor, I'm not sure that I can get through all this on Saturday, but we're going to do our best to cover as much stuff that the audience, the attendees want to have covered on that day, uh, whether that's focused on documentation or focused on deal structuring or analyzing or whatever. Um, I have a lot of things I want to cover, but I'm going to really focus it in on what the students want to have covered. And again, I think we're going to be, exhausted, knuckle dragging, tired, but excited at the end of the day, because you're going to have a new tool in your toolbox. So I just hope that you take advantage of it and, and come join us. Well, awesome, Tim, as always, appreciate you. Grateful for you. And uh, guys, check out that link. I'll see you guys on Saturday and uh, Tim will be there as well. Obviously he's doing the event, but uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys and guys have a great day.